Have you heard the news? If you haven't listened to Maine Public Radio today, you haven't heard the news. From Fort Kent to Kittery, from Morning Edition to Weekly Edition, from Midday to Maine Things Considered, turn to Maine Public Radio. For 25 years, your main source for in-depth news. Have you heard the news? If you haven't listened to Maine Public Radio today, you haven't heard the news. Indonesia. Two brothers take us from islands where pirates still sail and magicians still hold sway into the Ring of Fire. Join their adventures again this summer on PBS. Tuesday evening at 9. Heart of Mystery. Where peaks of ice shadow rivers of fire. Heart of Wonder where the continent's smallest primate comes face to face with its largest insect. Heart of drama, where rulers of the air hunt beneath the waves and the inhabitants are naturalists in their own right. National Geographic's Heart of Africa, a new three-part series, beginning July 15th. Major support for Wall Street Week on Maine Public Television is made possible by the Trust Department of Bangor Savings Bank, providing trust and investment services to Maine people and their families. Additional support is provided by Nelson Rarities, worldwide buyers, sellers, and appraisers of antique and estate jewelry with headquarters in Portland, Maine. century, America's most popular program about the economy, people, and their money, Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the annual financial support from viewers like you, by Prudential Securities, with more than 5,600 financial advisors nationwide, Prudential Securities can help you invest your money wisely, by A.G. Edwards, serving the investment needs of individuals and businesses for more than 100 years, built on a foundation of trust, research, and commitment to investor success. And by Oppenheimer Funds, because solid investment performance and sound financial planning go hand in hand. Produced Friday, July 5th. Good evening. I'm Louis Rukeyser. And yes, don't let the casual attire throw you. This really is Wall Street Week. So welcome back. And welcome to our very special 4th of July weekend barbecue of the Bulls and Bears. Our staff is taking a holiday weekend off for the first time in two and a half years. So instead of our usual program tonight, we've taped a review of some of the most memorable highlights of our programs over the past year. Three of the most timeless moments that so many of you said you wanted to see again. And as always, we live to serve, even if it's just a hot dog. Given the informal nature of tonight's party, I've dressed to match, and I hope you have too. In the course of the program, you'll see me in some other unusual settings. In keeping with our traditional motto, it's just your money, not your life. And in case you were wondering, yes, even the elves are taking a night off and getting ready to be more all wet than ever. So kick back with me and relax as we sip our holiday drinks and chew again on some remarkable food for thought. From the future of your job to the past of Jacqueline Onassis and the 21st century thinking of Steve Jobs. We start with what to many people has been the most worrisome of these. One of the biggest stories of the 1990s has been corporate downsizing. A source of concern to Americans on both ends of the political spectrum 
It received a lot of attention during the Republican primaries and is likely to receive even more attention from Republicans and Democrats alike during the fall campaign. In April, I talked with the man whom some think of as the demon of downsizing, the influential author of Reengineering the Corporation, James Champy. Does reengineering have to be synonymous with downsizing? Lou, it doesn't, doesn't really. There's a choice that companies have. Reengineering is about fundamentally improving the way a company performs, the way people do their work. But the, the hard part of the truth, though, is that oftentimes, because we're doing this work in large, bureaucratic, very fragmented organizations, as you rethink the work dramatically, you find that there are excess jobs. There, there are jobs that no longer need to be done. So oftentimes there is that result of fewer jobs being created for what I think is a short-term period. Eventually, jobs do get created. Let's deal with that word greed. It was yes. thrown around a lot by Pat Buchanan. It was picked up by people both in his party, including Bob Dole, and by some people in the Clinton cabinet. Is this a function of greed? I don't think so. I think what's going on now is a, is a major change in our markets, driven by changes in government regulations, changes by information, driven by information technology, issues of companies trying to globalize and operate more broadly than their local markets. And these are changes that are demanding the companies just fundamentally operate in a different way. This is not something driven by greed. I think this is an ambition to make companies actually better. The figures I just recounted indicate that the salaried workers have been taking an increasing share of the downsizing. Yes. You and your work have talked about the particular effect on middle managers. Yes. I believe you said that they used to send uh, information up and orders down. That's right. And what's the story? The computers do it now? I think computers do it. I think one of the other things that's happening is that we're actually really now giving workers the power to make decisions that supervisors used to make. Now, I think that does mean that uh, over time we'll see the need for somewhere between 20 or 30 percent fewer middle managers. And supervisory decisions are being made elsewhere, and technology is doing a lot of their work. Let's, let's take two human aspects of this. Yes. What do you tell a middle manager in his or her 50s who is never again going to have a job like he or she had a year ago? I, I would tell them that, look, there's still an opportunity, in some sense, to get back to work, to go back, see customers, work in the marketplace, maybe go back on the line, if you will, and add value. I'll show you a lot of middle managers who actually have very boring jobs. And I, I think I could genuinely say to a middle manager, this is an opportunity to get back at the business again. The uh, Times talked about people who used to make 150000 now they're making 50000 Is that yes. really what's happening? Uh, I don't think it's happening that dramatically. Uh, certainly there is some real dislocation loop going on, and I think it will continue to go on for some period of time. Now let's look at the other end of the age scale. Look at a young person approaching college graduation, considering whether to take an MBA, considering yes. whether to go into business. Is there a future in management? Absolutely. I believe there is. And we still will need very capable managers within our organizations. I think the style of management will change. There isn't a future for people who are highly directive, who want to live in hierarchical organizations. There, there, there isn't a future for those kinds of people. There is a future for people who want to get out, work in the marketplace, really be driven by the marketplace and what it is they want to do. I think there's a bright future. Let me reverse the usual media question. If we hadn't downsized, or if you will, if we hadn't re-engineered, what would be our economic situation today? I think it would be bad. And you just have to compare us to the Europeans who have moved much more slowly and been much more protectionist around their companies. American companies today are, are, are just far ahead in their ability to operate in a global environment. I think if we hadn't done it, we, we would run the risk of even a higher unemployment rate, and we wouldn't see the profits and performance we're seeing now. I often accuse politicians of being too sensitive to public opinion. Maybe some CEOs have been not sensitive enough. Is there a problem with these guys getting paid $20 million a year when they're laying people off? Well, there could be. There's a problem in two respects. Uh, you know, there are a lot of short-term fixes that managers and senior managers are trying that are pure downsizing fixes. And I'm not convinced that those sharp downsizing moves that aren't real changes in the way companies operate will, will, will create a company that's good for the, for the long term. So I'd say to the compensation committee, if you're going to pay someone very aggressively, make sure you pay them on long-term corporate performance. But I'd also say to some of these individuals, be very careful that your greed not be misread. There's a symbolism is important here in trying to lead companies through change. And I might advise them to back off a little bit on the compensation. By the way, I think they deserve it for the job they're doing. But you think it's a public relations error to take it anyhow? I think it is a public relations error at this point. Not so much public relations outside, but, but inside the company. It can feed the cynicism that exists within some organizations.
interesting in this downsizing stuff. I wonder if this program could be just as efficient with only two panelists each week. Nah. But how about those computers that are replacing so many traditional kinds of work? In February, I talked with Steve Jobs, a man whose career personifies much of the American dream. Truly a Luke Skywalker of cyberspace. Now, before we meet tonight's special guest, let's get to know him a little better. At the age of 40, Steve Jobs is already one of the classic entrepreneurs of modern American history. An investor who has become a model for many who dream of building their fortunes by building their own companies. He began tinkering with electronics as a child and did most of his early work on this bench in his parents' garage. By the time he was 20, the first Apple computer emerged. And in 1976, when he was barely 21, Jobs co-founded Apple Computer Incorporated with his high school buddy, Steve Wozniak. Apple grew quickly, attracting a loyal following among early personal computer enthusiasts. On the day Apple went public in 1980, the 15% share held by Jobs, then just 25, was valued at $217 million. And some ordinary investors did well too. If you were smart or lucky enough to invest $10,000 in Apple Computer at its low in August 1985, your stock would have been worth more than 10 times that less than six years later, even if you didn't know a bit about bytes. Jobs was center stage when he unveiled the highly successful Macintosh computer in 1984. I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. But by 1985, Jobs' relationship with Apple had turned sour, and he resigned to run not one, but two other businesses. The first he called Next a company he built around an ambitious new personal computer that was released with much fanfare in 1988. But sales were less spectacular, and the sophisticated but expensive black box never caught on. The project was abandoned, and Next, still privately held, moved on to developing a new software writing technique that some technology buffs believe will eventually turn the internet into an indispensable tool for doing online business. While Next was evolving, Jobs was careful to diversify. He quietly invested 50 million of his own dollars in Pixar, a computer animation company in Richmond, California, that he had purchased from film producer George Lucas in 1986 for 10 million. Jobs' Pixar employees including former Disney animator John Lasseter, spent most of the next decade developing new 3D animation software, which they fine-tuned by producing some memorable television commercials. And short animated films. This one, entitled Tin Toy, won the Academy Award for Best Animated Short Film in 1988. Through all that computer-generated fun, Pixar developed the ability to take crafted models and reliably turn them into dynamic, three-dimensional computer images. 20 million Americans bought tickets to see the result last year, when Disney released Pixar's first feature-length computer-animated film, Toy Story, a blockbuster hit that has taken in more than $175 million in domestic box office alone. To infinity and beyond! And in what was perhaps the best-timed initial public offering in modern memory, Pixar made its market debut last November, just as Toy Story publicity, generated by Disney, was at its peak. When the stock soared close to $50 a share on the first day of trading, Steve Jobs' stake was briefly worth just under $1.5 billion. Not bad for an entrepreneur who began by tinkering in his parents' garage and is still barely old enough for a midlife crisis. What do you say I get someone else to watch the sheep tonight? <laughs> Hell yeah! Pixar's stock has tumbled since then. Even after gaining nearly two points today, it is still only 24 and a quarter, less than half where it traded on that giddy first